In the name of the Fa Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So it was about eight or nine years ago, and I remember being woefully behind on all of my Christmas shopping and all the other responsibilities at Christmas, and I feel like it was somewhere around uh, the 23rd of December. It wasn't Christmas Eve, uh, but it was right before it, and I realized that not only had I not done my Christmas shopping, that I absolutely had no idea what I was shopping for. Um, and so I went out to the mall one afternoon when I pulled a few hours of free time. I went to the mall and I was determined to take care of all of my Christmas shopping. Um, and I remember the mall was decked as you would expect it to be decked. I mean, there were uh, decorations along every uh, hallway in the middle of, of every uh, aisle. Uh, and every storefront had its own Christmas displays. Uh, there were bells jingling. Uh, there was a Santa. Uh, there were carols playing both inside every store and throughout the mall. Uh, and I looked, uh, and as my anxiety uh, grew, as I had no idea what I was shopping for, uh, I looked around and there were so many people, people packed in, uh, trying to do the exact same thing that I was doing, and they were trying to do their list, and I was trying to do mine, and I, I looked, and it, it was one of the least communal activities I've ever been part of. I mean, no one made eye contact, no one seemed happy, despite all of the symbols and all of the uh, metadata that told us that we were supposed to be joyful. Uh, this was a time for reverie. Um, everyone looked like they were in their own mind, trying frantically at this point, um, and you'd be surprised, there was a lot of men uh, doing their last minute shopping. Um, but it washed over me like a shiver that wouldn't go away. And I think I have never felt more alone uh, in my life than I was there in the middle of the mall. Uh, and I remember, and I love Christmas. I absolutely love Christmas. But I remember thinking, there has got to be more than this. There has got to be more than this. Uh, and it just shook me. And it made me think, uh, when I was a kid, and uh, some of you may remember this, uh, Advent felt almost just like Lent uh, inside the church. Uh, and as a kid, I remember feeling like, why is everyone outside celebrating? And back then it wasn't before Thanksgiving, but it wasn't much after Thanksgiving. Um, and we're in here telling people to wait, to hold your horses, to take some time to be quiet and still, and not just go out and, and uh, sing carols, uh, to enjoy or to let this season of Advent really, really resonate. And it didn't quite make sense. Um, but I think it speaks to that abiding truth. There is more going on here than just retelling the Christmas story again and again and reminding all of our children that it's not just Santa, it's about Jesus being born, which happened a long time ago. It is about the anticipation of so much more taking place in our lives, about God being at work, deeply at work, about waiting for God. Think about that scene with John the Baptist. Think about how crazy a scene that would have been. Some 30 plus miles from Jerusalem, all of these folks are gathered, not at the uh, opulent temple where they uh, know exactly how they're supposed to exchange uh, their money and make offerings for their sins. They are all there listening to this itinerant preacher um, with very few credentials. And people are just swarming. And it's probably chaotic. Uh, and it probably is about as dynamic a scene as you could imagine. And John isn't telling them everything's going to be great. He's not selling some sort of uh, 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 just follow me. And I promise your life will be rich and prosperous. And you'll be filled with joy. And everything will be great. He's actually calling them a brood of vipers. And we have these Pharisees and Sadducees, and it doesn't say they were there just scouting out the competition. They weren't just there to uh, uh, bring up charges against John or just to see what's going on. They were there to be baptized. Something compelled them towards this man uh, who is telling them that they better change or they are going to be cut at their very base. 
but they stay. And they don't just stay, they gravitate, and more and more people are gravitating. What is it about John that has so many people right there hanging on his every word, ready to be baptized, when he's not telling them it's going to be easy? He's not even telling them that they are going to be saved, but he is telling them there is more. This is not all there is. There is more. And the authenticity and the fervence of which he delivers that message convinces them. And he is an icon. He is a sacrament to the fact that God is never done with us. Remember his story? Elizabeth and Zacharias, they were, they were, they were grandparents. Or they were the age that people uh, are appreciate their grandchildren, but they hadn't had children. And they thought that dream was dead, that God was done with them. That the most important thing that they saw as their purpose in the world was never going to take place. And so John is a sacrament to the fact that God is not done. And that's his message. It's not an easy one. It doesn't say, uh, God's not done, but don't worry, everybody's going to get whatever they want under their tree this year. It's that it might hurt, and it might have cost. But God cares enough about you to promise you this isn't the end of the story. And it isn't just that God's keeping a, a huge list of all of your sins uh, but that God cares enough about every aspect of your life that God wants to draw you towards him. It is a loaded and gifted message. And it's what we do when we gather here in Advent. We leave room in our hearts to believe that God is not done. I talked a few weeks ago about that feeling that we've all had at different points in our life and that seemed more acute when I was a teenager of feeling like everything was in this moment, uh, was coming down, uh, every bad grade, every breakup seemed like it was the last time I would ever experience love, every bad grade seemed like this was the uh, only door that I was going to be able to walk through and it had just been slammed shut. Uh, and how much I wish I could speak to that 17-year-old uh, or 18-year-old and say there is so much more of the story to be told. And as adults, we have those moments too where we feel like the book has just been shut, the door has just been closed, and we need desperately to have a season where we don't just warmly sing carols, but where we leave room for absolutely abiding joy that joy that Paul talks about that comes from a God of hope filling us, filling us with a kind of joy and peace that has a resounding and abounding hope in our lives. So this is a season of being still. It's a season of making room. But it's a season for setting the stage. When I was in seminary, and I've told you this before, uh, I wasn't quite sure how God responded to my prayers. And my bishop at the time, um, who's here, um, <laughs> told me that praying was like setting the stage. That when you pray, you open those curtains, and you sit down, and you open yourself to the fact that something might happen on that stage. Advent is our time of the year for that that we sit and we open the curtains and we wait on God and we trust that when we wait on God, that God will be born anew in our hearts in ways that are unexpected and surprising and challenging, but that God will act. Like God acted for Elizabeth, like God acted for John, like God throughout history has always acted on our behalf. So it's not just about waiting for some uh, cataclysmic second coming, it's about setting up that manger in our hearts, getting it ready, opening it, throwing out things that don't need to be there, and expecting that this Christmas, God will be born anew, that there is more going on. This isn't all there is. God is waiting for us to be ready for him. Amen.